You know how I know this is a second generation group? There are no ties. I'm looking and I don't see any ties. And I want to say glory, hallelujah. I may not be part of your second generation, but I don't like ties. So I'm glad to be here. It is, it's, a, it's a great privilege for me. I have a message for all of you this afternoon, one that has been on my heart, uh, one that has been sort of churning in me for a number of years now. Abraham's missional call. Now you may be asking yourself, what does Abraham have to do with second generation Koreans? A lot, it turns out. In fact, what I'm going to say here in the next 15 or 20 minutes, exactly aligns with what Pastor Ko has said. Abraham was an immigrant in a strange land. By strange land, I mean the United States. <laughs> There's an analogy there. He was an immigrant. He came to a strange land. But he was on a mission from God. There is a profound sense that as followers of Jesus, each one of us is on a mission from God. Now, I want to stress that this is not just an individual mission, but it is part, your individual mission is part of a much larger mission. I don't want you to simply think of this in individualistic terms. I want you to locate yourself as second-generation Koreans in the larger redemptive historical plan of God. This conference is about second-generation Koreans. On the one hand, you have many distinctive features, aspects, and issues that are simply unique to you. And I hope to address some of those in the next few minutes. On the other hand, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that the second generation Koreans belong to this larger For me, that's very, very important. Let's get some facts on the table, so to speak. In the 1970s, as you all know, there was a significant migration of Koreans to the United States. And many of them became part of what we now call the first generation Korean churches. You've probably heard some reference somewhere along the way to the Immigration Act of 1965. And that removed some of the restrictions that had been in place and allowed especially Korean immigration to come to the United States. What's interesting is that Asians, but, but Koreans in particular, have been described as one of the most successful immigrant communities in the United States. There are some 2 million Koreans in the United States, some 4,000 churches. Some 70% of the first generation Korean Americans were affiliated with a Korean church. 70%. Now, I'm going to bank off of that particular fact in just a few moments. All of that to say is that when the, the doors opened in the United States, 
many Koreans came to the U.S. And those Koreans, your parents, were deeply devout. And if there's anything I want to say today, it is that I want to honor that first generation. To talk about the importance of the second generation does not come at the expense of the first generation. You stand on their shoulders, to be sure. But one of the things that's characteristic of the first generation Korean church is that it remained somewhat isolated from the American mainstream culture. Korean churches became Korean enclaves, and they centered on Korean culture, language, food, traditions, values. You go to a Korean church as a white American and I can see some of the distinctive features. The way you pray is different and distinctive. Your focus on the Holy Spirit, especially in Presbyterian reform circles, is distinctive. You mentioned the Southern Whites of the PCA. I, I know about the PCA. I used to be the living in the South. One thing that's true is there's not a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Shame on the PCA for not emphasizing the Holy Spirit more. But the Korean church has always emphasized the Holy Spirit. It goes back to Pyongyang in 1907. This first generation of Korean churches, on the one hand, they were missions-minded. That is to say, they were very happy and pleased to send missionaries, mostly to faraway places. But the first generation was not so much missional. I'm going to elaborate on that as we go through for a moment. First generation was missions-minded, but I fear it was not well, the immigration data, and I was just checking it the last couple of days, the data shows that Korean immigration to the United States has slowed to a trickle. Korean immigration to the United States is the lowest that it's been in decades. The Korean population of the United States is somewhat stagnant as the economic and political circumstances in South Korea have improved, fewer and fewer Koreans want to immigrate to the United States. We see this at Biblical Theological Seminary. Uh, it used to be that the third largest group of international students in the United States, universities and colleges, third largest was Korean students, but that has dropped in recent years, dropped at least 4%. And we're seeing some of that even at a biblical seminary. And I think the immigration policies of the new administration doesn't bode well uh, for immigration. So what does this mean? Well, if I can be candid, or if I can be frank, I, I mean, I already am frank, but if I can be frank, frank, here's what this means to all of us, is that there is little prospect of first-generation churches growing. It's going to be a challenge. I'm not saying individual churches can't or won't. I'm just saying the statistics are against the first generation church growing. But even more concerning is what we call the silent exodus. To my mind, this is even a greater challenge than the statistics that uh, the Korean church faces. There is an alarming development where many young Christians are now choosing 
to leave their home churches and in some cases even leave the Christian faith entirely. The reasons are not difficult to understand. Many young people raised in the church found their immigrant churches, and forgive me, I'm just reciting some of the data. They find their immigrant churches irrelevant, culturally stifling, and ill-equipped to prepare young people for life in a post-Christian world. One first-generation Korean pastor in Maryland observed that the Korean church, first-generation Korean church, has been busy just trying to survive and really hasn't had enough time or energy to focus on nurturing and nourishing the second generation. As a consequence, the second-generation Koreans tend to embrace American culture, sometimes post-Christian American culture. Sometimes they're more comfortable in multicultural churches or white churches. I can remember, it's been a few years now, that when I was in seminary in Philadelphia, I served in a Korean church. I was the EM. For four years, I ministered Sunday after Sunday to Korean kids from the first grade all the way to college. I was, I loved it. My wife and I, that was our first real introduction to kimchi and to Korean culture. It was also our first introduction to intense prayer, intense community. So there was a lot that we learned and appreciated. But I must confess that we noticed even then that there was a massive cultural and generational divide even then. The children didn't connect particularly well with their parents. Well, that brings us to the text I wanted to talk about just a little bit. This text is so important. I've been thinking about it a good deal in recent weeks. It's Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. I'm not going to expound the text in its fullness. I'm just going to renote some of the important redemptive historical implications of that text for us today. Let's take a few moments and reflect about Abraham, if I may. Abraham was called out of Ur of Chaldea. And then via Haran, he eventually made his way to Canaan. He was, in our parlance today, he was an immigrant. And when you are an immigrant, you must learn, whether you want to or not, how to be cross-cultural you necessarily engage people who think, look, speak differently from you. And you have to find a way to navigate those cultural norms. But Abraham was more than an immigrant. Abraham was called to fashion an alternative community amid a humanity that had gone astray. Let me just say that one more time. Abraham was not just an immigrant. He was called of God to fashion out an alternative community, an alternative way of thinking and living and being amid a humanity that had gone awry. Let's look at the context of Genesis 12. This is the text where 
Abraham has been called of God to go to the promised land, as we call it. In the first two chapters of Genesis, what we see is not just the creation of humanity. Yes, it's that, to be sure. But we see the manifestation of God's grand plan for all of humanity. And Adam and Eve were just the beginning. So don't just think of the first couple of chapters as the story of creation. It's that, gloriously so. But it's also the inauguration of God's great plan for humanity. He charged Adam and Eve with the responsibility to rule and subdue the earth on behalf of God. I mean, it boggles the mind to think of what that massive, magnificent charge was. This is not about power. It's about serving and expanding God's kingdom. That was the original mission, the grand plan of God. But then chapter 3 comes along, and the plans are upended. And although the grand plan of God was disrupted, It was not abandoned. Can I get an amen? The grand plan was disrupted, but it was not abandoned. Do you understand how important that is? That's important then, and it's important now. There are disruptions. And even the original plan had its disruptions. But the plan was not abandoned. Abandoned. God has never abandoned his plan, his grand plan, his original grand plan for humanity. And then we come to Genesis 12. Let me read it. The Lord God said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever disparages you or curses you, I will curse or disparage. And all the peoples on earth, this is the part that is so powerful, and all the peoples on earth, will be blessed through you, through Abraham the immigrant. And I will bless those who bless you, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through the immigrant Abraham. And so Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old set out from Haran. These verses are some of the most important verses in the entire Bible. You cannot understand Genesis well without a focus and understanding of Genesis 12, 1 through 4. In fact, I'm not sure you can understand the grand sweep of the Bible without Genesis 12 right in front of you. I'm not sure you can understand the plan of redemptive history apart from Genesis 12. I am even so bold as to say that Genesis 12 becomes the crucial link between creation and Jesus. Let me say that again. It's a crucial link between
between the creation, the original plan of God, and Jesus. I'll say more. In Genesis, God initiates his original plan. He wants humans to rule and subdue the earth in his name and for his sake. There's a disruption of the original plan because of original sin. But Genesis 12 comes along and we find God reaffirming his original plan. He will not be undermined. His plan will not be stopped, not even by sin. God makes a covenant. It is a distinct series of promises without qualification, I might add. These are things that God says by his honor that he will do. He will establish his rule and ultimately through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, his plan will reach its fulfillment. Four blessings. God says, I will bless you. He says, you will be a blessing. You, the immigrant Abraham, will be a blessing. And I, God, will bless those who bless you. And then he says, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham, the immigrant. I want to suggest to you that this is the reaffirmation of God's original mission to bring all things under his reign. Now, when you look at those four verses, the four blessings, as I call them, you notice that it begins with a narrow call of an individual, Abraham. God called an individual, a single human being, to embark on this mission, this mission to reaffirm the original plan. But very quickly, by verse 2 and 3, we see that the individualized calling of Abraham has now expanded to a nation. So God's mission for Abraham moves from the individual to the nation and, oh yes, to the whole earth. In other words, God has given Abraham the biggest mission imaginable. The mission of God in Genesis 12 is not simply about Abraham. It's about reclaiming the earth that God and the plan that God had originally given Adam and Eve. It is the reassertion of God's original plan. But this time, the grand plan has been rerouted through the immigrant Abraham. So God's mission, one of the things we learn from this passage is that God's mission is expansive. Second, we learn that God's mission from this text requires faith. Abraham is called to a mission of God, but from a human perspective, there are no guarantees of success from a human perspective. So this mission to which God has called Abraham requires faith, an extraordinary, unbelievable faith. Hebrews 11 makes this rather clear. Paul, the author of Hebrews, writes, By faith Abraham, when called to go, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. They, Abraham and Sarah, did not receive the things promised, but they welcomed them from a distance. 
And when God called the immigrant, Abraham, to this grand vision, this missional faith is the kind of faith that trusts God even though it is not easy. I don't want anyone to walk away from listening to me thinking that when God calls you to his mission, to you individually, to you corporately, that it's going to be easy. That is a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be called of God. I can assure you it will not be easy. Think about Abraham. He faced challenges of childlessness, famine, exile. Some have argued even the kidnapping of his wife and then war against several kings. For Abraham to obey God was really hard. Even though God had made these powerful promises, the truth of the matter is it's going to be hard. Secondly, this missional faith to which Abraham was called called him to a ministry and a mission where the road map was not always clear. It's hard to look into the future and to know exactly how God is going to use you. For all of us, president of a seminary, we don't always have a road map. Not only is it hard, but you have to live by faith. This missional faith to which Abraham was called always looked to the future. There was an eschatological or a future orientation. What does he say in Hebrews 11? Abraham was looking forward, and he welcomed the promise from a distance. So we're always looking and hoping and trusting by faith that it will come to pass. Now here's a kicker. Here is the thing that causes my heart to leap. When you look at Galatians 3, 8 and 9, where Paul is talking about this Genesis 12 passage, Listen to what Paul says. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Let me just be very clear. You and I, by faith, are the children of Abraham. Make no mistake about that. When this text is talking about the children of Abraham, don't look out there. Look here. Because that's you. That's me. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham when he said, All the nations will be blessed through you. Paul is telling us in Galatians 3 that Genesis 12 is the gospel in advance. It is the gospel. It is the good news. It's the reaffirmation of God's original plan, the one that could not be stopped because God had promised. Genesis 12, the original plan was reasserted, and the mission of Abraham is brought to fulfillment in the good news The good news is that God is on a mission of redemption. A mission of redemption by grace through faith alone. Can I get an amen? That's good stuff. That warms the cockles of my reformed heart. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Let me conclude. This is going to be a little more of an elaborate conclusion. 
one darkness. What's my time frame? I've got a few minutes. One Dartmouth undergraduate described herself as, and I quote, Korean on the outside, but American on the inside. She was a second generation Korean. The children of the first generation Korean immigrants are pulled between two cultures. They're pulled between their own historic cultural heritage of their parents and that of the land of their birth or the land to which they came when they were very young. Now many first generation Korean immigrants were troubled by their children, you, you second generationers. Sometimes they, they spoke of you as a problem because you really didn't have much knowledge and maybe less appreciation for your ancestral heritage. The first generation attempted to instill those values and those sensibilities in you, the children. But you were often unwilling and reluctant to embrace these traditions. When your parents spoke to you in Korean at home, you responded in English. You can't get much more bicultural than that. The second generation Koreans live and breathe American culture. Now, this assimilation that second-generation Koreans have done, I think it's not just fitting in. It's probably that, to be sure. But I think it's more than just fitting in. I think it's more than just cultural survival. I think in God's providence, the fact that second generation Koreans were able, encouraged, had to assimilate, it meant that you had to learn how to build relationships with people who were not necessarily like you in every way. So assimilation, I, 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 there's a lot to be said about some pros and cons, the pressures that come to bear upon someone to have to assimilate into another culture dominated by another ethnic group. There are challenges there, to be sure. But one of the benefits of having to assimilate into another culture is this skill that is learned, the skill on how to build relationships. I want to argue that that will serve you very, very well. I want to put forward a thesis. I think I'm right about this. And Pastor Ko, I think this aligns exactly with what I've read of some of your writings and what I heard you say today. But this is my thesis. It might even be considered a new vision. The cross-cultural challenges and experiences of second-generation Koreans give them a missional advantage. Let me say that again. The cross-cultural challenges that you have experienced of necessity actually gives you an advantage to accomplish the mission of God. You already understand the power of culture, the inherent complexities of integrating into another culture. You understand how difficult and how challenging that can be. And those who are most successful have been successful in part because they have learned to transcend those cultural boundaries on the basis of building relationships. My thesis is that from a missional perspective, 
second generation Koreans are uniquely prepared, uniquely equipped to further the mission of God. Here's why I say that. Like many immigrants, first generation Koreans believed that education was the key to success. And as a result, the first generation made astonishing sacrifices on behalf of the second generation to ensure that they got the best possible education. They applied enormous pressure on you to succeed. I've seen the, the blurry eyes and the slumped shoulders and the sleep-deprived second generation because of that pressure that the parents placed on them to succeed educationally. So it's not surprising that in American culture today, among the most successful immigrants at the educational level are Asians and Korean Americans. You know that some of our elite schools, take for example UC Berkeley, Asians make up nearly 43% of the entire student population at UC Berkeley. Whites only make up 28%. Where does that come from? It comes from that immigrant experience where the first generation put pressure, sometimes too much pressure, on the second generation to succeed. And succeed you did. first generation pressed the second generation to succeed educationally. And in that process, you have had to learn how to be culturally adept. You are bicultural. You understand how to go back and forth. Your parents will ask you questions in Korean you respond in English. You have successfully learned how to navigate those cultural boundaries. You may eat kimchi at home, but you eat Tex-Mex with your friends. I know that about you. So you're culturally adept. You're well-educated. You're culturally adept. And you also have a strong Christian heritage. As I noted earlier, some 70% of second generation Koreans have been raised in Christian homes. You have Christian values. Even if you have pushed back against the pressures and the annoying parents who told you that you had to do certain things, those values, those Christian ideas were there and they permeated your home life. Have you ever noticed that when you go to Redeemer Church here in New York City, it's largely Asian. Some wags have said that Tim Keller's church is the largest Korean church on the East Coast. And there's a lot of truth to that. Why is that? Why are there so many Asians and Koreans in particular at Tim Keller's church? I'm going to tell you why. It's because first generation parents pushed the second generation to excel academically. Which means that you went to the best institutions. And because you went to the best institutions, you got the best jobs. And the best jobs, some of the best jobs. I got a great job in Philadelphia. Some of the great jobs are in New York City. And so there is a great number of second generation Koreans in New York. They've landed there and they still retain those Christian instincts and values they've been taught by the first generation. They're not overly inclined to go to Korean, first generation Korean churches. 
but they have found a welcoming place at a place like Redeemer. One more thing. One of the things that characterizes the millennial generation in North America, it's true, I think, in many ways of second generation Koreans as well, and that is a strong sense of social justice. Why would I say that? Why would I say that second generation Koreans have, like millennials in North America, have a particular sensitivity to issues of social justice? I'll tell you why. It's because you have experience in this cross-cultural experience of coming to the United States, growing up in the United States, you have experienced marginalization and worse, sometimes out and out racism. You have experienced this marginalization by the dominant culture. I, I, I absolutely know this is true. You have experienced the marginalization by the white evangelical church in many respects. Let's be honest. It's true. I know that. You know that. Because of your unique social location and your cultural experiences, both good and bad, the experiences that you've had with the dominant culture, you have acquired a sensibility for justice. Not unlike millennials in North America. I think about uh, at Biblical Seminary. Uh, one of the concerns that my Korean students have, they come to me a number of times and they say, you know, when I go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, the DMV, those people are rude and mean-spirited. And they say, is this racism? And I say, no, that's just a qualification to work at the DMV doesn't make any difference whether you're Korean, Asian, or, or a Texan in my case. Now, they're rude to everybody. But these experiences of marginalization and indeed racism have created an awareness, a sensitivity to injustice. And you have acquired this sensibility they have become the very means by which you can and must engage the mission of God. I am persuaded that the mission of God, that the mission that God called Abraham to, was a cross-cultural mission. It was not easy for him. He had a number of missteps along the way. But I believe that the mission of God called him and us, especially those of the second generation Koreans, to enter into the cultural maelstrom of the modern world in the United States. Isn't this what Paul called all of us to when he said, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Brothers and sisters, my thesis is that you have been uniquely by virtue of your immigrant experience, by virtue of the challenges that you've experienced between the first and second generation, by the experiences of having to assimilate, by the experiences perhaps of marginalization and injustice, that you have been unique. and to be part of the mission of God today, right now, here. Can I get an amen? amen. Let me
pray for us. Father, you are marvelous. You work in mysterious, extraordinary ways. You surprise us. You don't always call us to the easy path. You often call us to the challenging path. And that is all too often the path for those of us who are on a mission from you. Father, may we be mindful that we are part of a very, very long heritage. One that began in Genesis 1, was renewed in Genesis 12, and has been renewed again and again and again throughout the pages of Scripture. And that you have worked in this day and this time in this generation, this second generation, Korean community, that you have equipped them in particular ways. Lord, may you use them to serve your purposes. In Jesus' name.